Hey everybody, it's Corey from CoreyBakerFilmmaker.com, and I just saw Curse of La Llorona, written by Mickey Daughtry, Tobias Iakinis, and directed by Michael Chavez. So I saw this like at the AMC Burbank 8. Now, uh, for the last couple reviews for John Wick 3 and for Avengers Endgame, you might have heard me talk about the AMC Burbank 16. This is a completely different theater. So there is a Burbank Town Center Mall that's literally right around the corner from the 16. And inside of that, they have a small little movie theater that is 100% definitely like this 80s, 90s style theater. Uh, we went in, it smelled like a 90s theater. And that's not to say that it smelled bad or that there was something weird about it. It's just that like, it sort of took me back to the feeling of being in these sort of theaters inside of malls. And it's a cool little place. I mean, like the they have really comfortable seats. The theaters are really small, but uh, it's a cool little place to go check out a movie. And it seems like it's a little bit more off the beaten path as opposed to 16. So if there's some movie that you really want to see, but it looks like it's sold out everywhere in the 16, maybe check out the AMC Burbank 8. So the plot of Curse of La Llorona, it, it basically follows this old uh, Mexican folk tale of a woman who kills her children and in this movie she sort of comes about and is still killing children and uh particularly we follow uh linda cardellini's character of anna she is a social worker and there is a mother who they need to do a check on the children with and she finds them locked up in the closet and then a day or two later they're dead uh drowned in the river and the mother blames Linda Cardellini's character for what happened and curses them with uh, La Llorona, who goes to murder Linda Cardellini's children. So this flick is a little bit all over the place. Personally speaking, I think horror movies have sort of taken a weird turn in the last 10 or 15 years and don't know if I necessarily feel like they're getting better. For a long time, there was sort of this feeling, I think, amongst sort of the independent film community that an easy way to get a movie made is to do a horror movie because you can make them for cheaper than you could like a big action movie. And uh, horror sells really well and it travels really well uh, all across the world. People enjoy a horror movie. Uh, because it doesn't take a lot to, to understand intricacies of, you know, certain cultures or anything like that. It's just all about scaring you. And I think that a lot of filmmakers who've sort of gone down this path have been more about the creepiness and the suspense and not so much the horror or the terror. Uh, this movie is part of, like, sort of the extended... Conjuring universe, which I'm not really like, really huge onto. I, I I never really got into the whole thing, but it doesn't have any direct connection. I mean, like honestly, it's just like you see dolls every once in a while and sort of like like-minded shots, but nothing that really rises to the. This isn't like you know the MCU where. You need to have seen this to be able to understand what goes on in the next Annabelle movie. It, it's just, uh, it just sort of seems to be a little bit all over the place. One thing I did really like about this flick was that it had a lot of people in it I like. Uh, Linda Carlini's agent has been going overtime getting her all kinds of work because I see her in everything nowadays. Um, uh, Roman Cristo and Janie Lynn Kinshin are the children of Linda Cardellini, and they both do a wonderful job. It, it, the The level in the last couple of years of child actors has gone way the hell up, and there's a lot of really fascinating actors in that space, and I'd be interested in seeing uh, more of them and uh, more of these kids in particular. Uh, and Raymond Cruz is in this movie, too. Uh, He's been in a whole ton of stuff. You've seen him before. And he does a really good job in this. It's a little... He's a little more menacing, a little less, like, of a fully developed character. But, I mean, like, he, he's sort of playing this gruff character, and that's just part of how it goes. 
So to me, pretty much all the problems about this movie really have to do with the fact that the plot doesn't really develop in a way that makes it ever feel truly scary. So, I mean, it's... You spend a lot of time trying to, like, escape La Llorona, but there's not really any moments... So... A big thing in screenwriting is about putting in your characters in the worst possible situation and trying to get them to wriggle out of it. And while having La Llorona come after your children and the children being scared and being worried about being killed by La Llorona, there is more that goes into it than just the threat of being killed. And none of that really exists in this movie. It's very... It's not boring, but it just doesn't feel like there's ever a moment where you're super in doubt about the livelihood of these children. Like, it's... They're they're not going to die, and I never felt like it was anywhere close to them dying. And, you know, in addition, there's never a moment during this movie where I was particularly scared. And... You know, jump scares and everything like that are fine, but I, I when you can see them coming from a thousand feet away, it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't. It doesn't have the same sort of moment of oh my god, I didn't expect that. If you can see it coming from so far ahead, more than anything, it just felt like lazy a little bit, and I, I don't mean to say that to like you know, put anyone down or anything like that because there's so much that goes into a movie it's hard to say why any particular thing happened, but it it just seemed like there wasn't anything super inspired about any of the departments in the movie like, you know the the best I can probably say is that uh, La Rona looked creepy, so like hair, makeup, production design, they did a great job with that but but it it just so one thing that really bothered me and i it's probably just a thing that bothers me and it doesn't bother people who aren't like very familiar with how editing works these days but uh they keep doing speed ramping throughout the entire movie and i swear it happens every 10 minutes or so where they're uh, one that happens really early in the movie is, you know, the children running into the house and Linda Cardellini following. And you could tell that the camera, the steady cam work, just wasn't quick enough on the pivot. So when they go in the door and they're turning right immediately and the camera's got to pivot around with them, the camera just wasn't fast enough for how quickly they wanted it to play on screen. So they speed ramp the turn. And basically what that means is they, instead of playing it at normal speed, they play it at like one and a half speed, which is fine because sometimes you can do that and it can be really effective. It can add like sort of a feeling to the thing. But when you're doing it to replace things that you could have just gotten right on set and you're trying to fix something, it it becomes more noticeable. So it it almost felt like they said uh, we don't have time to do this again we just have to live with the best take we got and we'll fix it in post and fix it in post is like a famous like we screwed up and we're just going to have to figure out some sort of way to make it work kind of expression like you don't want to fix it in post and you know maybe they were running late on the day maybe they were going to go into overtime maybe they couldn't uh, do another shot because they needed to let the kid actors go. It's there's a lot of things that could factor into this, but the speed ramping effect is happening all the time throughout this movie, and for not any particularly good reason. So if you listen to podcasts, for instance, and if you do, please subscribe to the Corey Baker Filmmaker Movie Review Podcast. If you listen to a podcast at like regular speed. And then say every, say you were listening to, I don't know, Pod Save America, just throwing out a random one. And you're listening to it at 1x speed. And then every 10 minutes for 30 seconds, it just boosts to 1.5 speed. You would be very thrown off by this. And 
you might not even necessarily notice that it happened. Like maybe you're doing other things while you're listening to the podcast. You're not dialed into every single word and you miss that part of it was done faster than the rest. But subliminally, it hits you in a way that just sort of like make it, it, it it's unsettling it just it doesn't feel right and it it's something that like just it felt like way too often in this movie they were trying to cover up for some sort of mistake with a trick that made it seem more apparent than if they would have just left it in as they had originally shot it one more thing about the script and sort of like where i think they went wrong it Part of when you get hired to write a screenplay is we have the rights to this or we want to do something about this and it's give me the best version of the story that you feel like you can give me in this regard. So uh, Slender Man, for instance, I want to make a movie about Slender Man and I want to put it to market before anybody else, as happened with the Slender Man movie. But I... I have the rights. I want to get to it before anybody else. So I got to hurry up and get a script so we could get in production so we could shoot it so we can release it. Hopefully before the whole Slender Band thing dies down. This movie, Lyrona, with this script just feels like it was the first idea. Like we, we came up with the first thing that we thought of. We wrote it down. We fixed the first draft. We, we made it more reasonable. And now we're going to put it out there. Like, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of thought involved in how we can make the best version of a story based off of something that happened before that doesn't really have to follow any kind of... I mean, like, you want it to follow the key structure beats of what La Llorona is as, like, sort of a folktale, but you don't get the opportunity to... You, you, you got to play around in the space a little bit, and they just didn't. Like, it was very... It, it really just felt like everybody was pressed for time and they were trying to get it out. And when you do something like that, people can feel it. It's just really tough to understand where the logic came from on a lot of the decisions that they made on this flick. Acting normal, acting normal. Leaderboard! Uh, I got you with that jump scare. Uh... This is the first movie I've seen at AMC Burbank. Eight, interesting place. Would definitely check it out, especially because it seems like they have a little bit like more of like an independent flair to the things that they're showing. So I love some indie films, so I'll probably be back. Um, on to the leaderboard. Uh, on, uh, what am I going to do with you? I mean, it's something I've said before on kind of movies that aren't that great. It's fine background noise. If you enjoy having like a running stream of horror movies that live in the background of your life, then La Llorona should make the list because it's it's perfectly fine to not watch. Like it's 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 a it's a good horror movie to like have on while you're doing the dishes and you're not like really locked in on all the details because there's not really a whole lot of details to speak of. But it's Good. It's not, I mean, it's not like a bad movie. It's not a, it's not done incorrectly. It's just not, it, it just feels half assed. So if you're half assed and you're viewing of it, then you don't really notice that as much as if you're locked in full attention. That being said, I would give Curse of La Llorona. 4.4 4. but horror movies it's not all about what you see on the screen it's a little bit deeper than that so why don't we do a quick Fast and the Furious leaderboard Drop. too fast Drop. too furious I'm too fast for y'all man Fast and the Furious leaderboard time uh, this movie like it, it's not fair to judge it against Roma it's not the same thing. It's it, And if you go in with that kind of expectation, then you're really going to be upset when you get out of it because that's not what any horror movie is. But this movie, I mean, if I had to give it a review under the Fast and the Furious leaderboard, I'd give it a 5-2. I mean, it, it it's really not 
great, but it's fine. Worth worth the uh, worth just taking in. I mean, it, it's don't don't really sit there. Just put it on. Have have it on as background noise. Uh, it's less depressing than CNN. So take it for what you will. Anyway, uh, that is everything for me. If you want more, you can go to my website, CoreyBakerFilmmaker.com, Facebook.com forward slash CoreyBakerFilm, or at LegendsCB5 on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Please subscribe to the Corey Baker Filmmaker Movie Review Podcast if you want these on the go, if you don't want to be tied down to your YouTube. I'm all about making things as available as possible everywhere they are, so audio versions available on that podcast. Uh, please like comment, whatever you want to do, subscribe to this video. Let me know if you enjoyed it. There's a ton of great movies coming up. I'm still trying to figure out what my movie this weekend will be. Uh, I know Rachel is really pushing to go see Aladdin. Uh, I really want to see Dog's Journey. Uh, we got a ton of great things coming up with Rocket Man, uh, Godzilla. There's a Tarantino movie on the way, so lots of great things coming up. As long as I have the opportunity to see multiple movies a week, I'm going to do multiple reviews a week. Uh, usually, I would like to do them on Monday and Thursday, but this week in particular, I was slammed on set all week, so the availability to make these reviews fell back a little bit. But thank you so much for being a part. Appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time, assuming that I don't get drowned in the river by some fable. <laughs>